ready. Time is 6.30. Call the meeting to order. Members present. Uh, Mike Ahern, Acting Chairman. John Krukenberg, Chairman, uh, absent today. John Renlet, Acting Vice Chairman. Bert Sutcliffe. Charlie Berman, Selectman's Rep. Paul Wilson. Rhonda Bishop. Bob Dragon, Alternate. John Kelly, Alternate and Daryl Brown, Selectman's alternate in the audience. Staff President, Brian Murphy, Building Inspector, Code Enforcement Officer, and we'll go to item three, public comments. Seeing none. Item four, consideration of May 20th. <clears throat> Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight, nine. I think there's one on eight. The last bullet of the first section there, that John Kelly was relieved of his alternate position, was that returned to? He was relieved. He was relieved. He left. Oh, it is relieved then. I thought that no longer being a voting member, he would be returned to his alternate. But I guess he yeah. left for yeah. the day, so that is correct. <coughs> we have a motion for the minutes. I make a motion we accept the minutes as written. Second. I'll second it. All those in favor of accepting the minutes as is? Aye. 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 Okay. Brian, do we have any significant correspondence for the meeting? No, sir, Mr. Chairman, we do not. All right. And that brings us to item six, old business, a site plan review for a continuance of the discussion and public hearing on 345 Highland Street, approximately five acres. Uh, the proposals construct a 13,255 retail pharmacy with associated parking access and utility improvements. The application was submitted by GB New Hampshire to LLC. I recused myself the last meeting when we talked about this. I will recuse myself again. Acting Chairman John Rinlet will run this portion. Thank you. Mike, um, since John's not here to vote, we need to pick an alternate. Yes. Uh, John Kelly, you and Bob Dragon will also recuse himself. Yeah. John Kelly, you were set in on that, so I'll have you sit on again. Thank you. Okay. Do we have a second? Two, three, four, Thank five. You. Six, we'll have back. six. Uh, hey, remember. <laughs> All right. Um, Thank you. Bye. 
Did uh, the planning board, uh, everybody got their packet and reviewed it? Okay. Um, at this time, um, does CBS have anything that they would like to present at this time? Other that they did not present at the last meeting or uh, that has come up since then? Yes, I would. I'm Linda Call, the attorney for the project, uh, McLean, Ralph Rollerson, and Middleton. Um, this is Dave Fenstermarcher of BHB, project engineer, who's going <coughs> to copy of the site plan so everybody can have it in mind again. Uh, we also have um, Meredith Graham, the traffic engineer from BHB here, as well as the architect for the project, uh, Bryce. Uh, Sorry, I wanted to call him Anderson too. Um, and then with me is my summer associate who's been providing me some help. Uh, we, this time of year, are lucky to have law students uh, available to help us. Uh, is uh, behind the maps, uh, Jeffrey Kirsch. Uh, so we got the whole team here. Um, again, we won't go back through all of the project. Um, we had basically gotten through most of it, I think, the last hearing, mm -hmm. and really there was a motion made because of questions raised uh, about whether there needed to be mitigation mm -hmm. um, because we are in the floodplain, mm -hmm. um, and there was a question whether there should be one-to-one -one mitigation for all the fill that we have to bring into this site, and the fill is required by your zoning ordinance, by the floodplain. The credit union similarly put in fill. The plan is to bring fill in to basically be at the same grade as the credit union. One of the things that has been submitted since the last meeting, something that was requested, is the proposed easement agreement that we both basically agreed to as to form, mm -hmm. obviously still subject to approvals here but to allow us basically to have a pedestrian walkway between the sites so any customers that want to go back and forth between the sites can do so on foot rather than going back out to Highland Street. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the site now. What Woodlands had to do in going first in building was to build a huge retaining wall and the two properties are at two very different levels. Without that easement agreement, we would basically have no other choice but to do a similar retaining wall on our property, which would basically leave this no man's land of two retaining walls facing each other, looking like some sort of medieval moat. And so we did not want to create that, and that's why we, you know, worked with our neighbor to get that easement agreement, and they, you know, been very cooperative in doing that, which we think will be an improvement for both of our properties. But because of that fill, this board started to become concerned um, because it was in the floodplain, there was some suggestion, well, in other projects across Tenney Mountain Highway, that there was a thinking that they had had to do a one-to-one -one ratio of taking fill out of the floodplain if they were putting fill back in. And there was a motion made basically to have your planner and staff do some investigation as to what had been done in the past. Um, and that staff report really shows you the research that's been done and really distinguishes the properties that have been approved on the other side of Tenney Mountain Highway. Points out that Tenney Mountain Highway in itself is somewhat of a dam situation and helping the floodplain on this side but that those properties are in an environmentally sensitive zone overlay district as well as partly in the floodway and your zoning ordinance requires in the floodway for there to be one-to-one -one mitigation and that report also cited the special instances that were in those cases of I think it was also relying on the size of the project and the environmentally sensitive district 
and wetlands on the um, Home Depot site where there may have been more extensive mitigation that would have been required otherwise. But that they were very different projects than this side of Tenney Mountain Highway where it was reported to the board that the Burger King property and the Woodlands Credit Union property were not required to do such mitigation. And our engineers also submitted a supplementary report to basically you know, show you where the floodplain is um, to basically say they reviewed the report that was done for the Woodlands Credit Union when there was a suggestion that that fill might have an impact in a flood situation in which there was the assessment that it wouldn't um, and that same assessment they think would apply to our property. So again, both factually and legally, I don't think there's any basis to do one-on-one -on -one mitigation on this property. Your planner did suggest if you, you know, wanted to look at this situation further in the future for making some change to your zoning ordinance, you certainly could do so for a, with a subcommittee to do that. But for this project, um, you ought to pot apply the existing rule and not require one to one <coughs> mitigation, that they're just factually and legally isn't a requirement for it at this point. So we would hope the board would solve that issue on that basis. In addition to that, if you recall, there were was a uh, report by your consulting engineer that we, I think, had just received the day of the hearing, or very close to the hearing. Our engineers have also done a submittal that basically itemizes how each of those issues are addressed. And I think, <coughs> with the exception of the traffic and site plan fee issue, or site impact fee, I think the engineers are fine on the other points being addressed. Say that's accurate, from my standpoint. I assume you are Mike. Mike oh, my nice to meet you, Linda Connell. Um, so I think we're through those issues. So I think where we are, as far as a new issue goes, that I would like to address is whether this project, whether this planning board needs to try to ass assess a site impact fee because of the traffic situation created by this project. And you've got I got to see a very strongly worded uh, a plea from your planner just this afternoon saying, please, you know, be fair, make sure that everybody that contributes to a future development need pays their fair share by paying a site impact fee. In principle, we have no dispute with that. You know, yes, everybody should pay their fair share. We want to pay our fair share. That email really didn't concentrate on this particular project and this particular intersection. Mm -hmm. And again, we want to pay our fair share. We just think in this case um, and this intersection, which we're pleased is already approved. Remember why this site is attractive to us is it is well-traveled. Our traffic report reports that pharmacies like us get 50% of their business just by people driving by and deciding, oops, there's something I need at CVS. It's, it amazes me that that's what the statistics are, but if you look in more urban environments, that's literally the rationale why, why you see even same brand stores as close as a mile and a half apart. <laughs> It's just that study that they have consistently shown that people make those decisions to make the quick purchase and remember that they need to get something that they need on that quick basis because they drove by. So we are here because it does get traffic. Mm -hmm. it, it is already a traff, you know, a road that's very close to the state highway. It already has a traffic light. You know, that's why we're here. That's why it was a good site. Um, and the traffic analysis that we first submitted um, basically showed that, you know, the <coughs> grade the intersection out at Tenney Mountain Highway and Highland Street. And by the way, I've got the traffic engineer here who I'm told to pop up, and if I say anything wrong, she's supposed to correct me because I am a lawyer. I try to understand these things, but I talk to her first and try to make sure I've understood it accurately. And I, you know, she's under firm instruction, don't let me put my foot in my mouth. I don't want to get anything wrong. So, Meredith, don't be shy. <laughs> Um, but you basically grade an intersection 
like the school grades from A to F, FB failing, and it's called LOS, level of service. What was initially submitted in the initial traffic report, you can see, really focuses on the intersection as a whole and its grade. And basically summarizing, and I think Meredith reported to you last time, you know, this is an easy one. There's you know, <coughs> one second change overall. You know, we basically just don't make any significant impact. So we didn't really think of us of having a traffic issue here, um, except there was the concern that our original traffic report was based on looking forward to 20, I have a hard time with these numbers, they seem so funny to me, 2021, that's only 11 years away, um, is looking and assuming that the Lowe's project would be built. And that's really to meet DOT standards that that's on the plans, it's been approved, so we're supposed to take that into account. So we were asked by the board, and I think Mr. Um, Bignelli suggested it, that you ought to also see what it would look like if that project never happens. And that's why we submitted a second supplement to that report. But basically, it shows the same thing, that even if you say Lowe's doesn't happen, Lowe's improvements don't happen, it's still basically an intersection that's still functioning in 2011, whether we build or whether we don't build, it's basically a C grade, which is perfectly acceptable, um, and we affect it in a minor way overall. And again, that's the bottom line grade for the intersection. This is like for your entire paper, you get one grade for the entire intersection. But what your consulting engineer has flagged for you appropriately is really looking at the individual grades of each movement within that intersection and is really flagging for you correctly the worst case of where CBS makes an impact on an individual movement. And that movement is basically the left-hand turn from Highland Street out onto Tenney Mountain Highway. And again, there's a light here. Because it's only a three-legged intersection at this point, the traffic either just goes right or it goes left. But there's only two lanes out there right now. So basically what it shows in 2021, if the Lowe's project never goes forward, this stays a three-legged intersection, there is an additional four second wait at this light to go left and basically a one and a half car lengths in the left turn lane waiting to make that left turn. The grade doesn't change. Um, and that's, it ha does degrade where the overall intersection in 2021 is still a C that individual left turn is degraded to a D movement. If you look at the initial report in 2011, which assumes when we get approvals and go, can go forward to build, when the CVS project would come online, start affecting the traffic, there's that kind of impact, but it still say, stays at a C level of traffic on that turn. It doesn't dig degrade to a D level until you look at that 20, 21. And what the traffic and analysis you've got before you, if you look at the detail of the attachments, is that that degrade exists whether CBS exists or not, which is the no build scenario is that for whatever reason CBS property never gets developed, you know, this traffic intersection will just get more traffic because of other things that happen in the next 10 years. So in the next 10 years, if nothing happens on this site whatsoever to change, that individual movement still it gets a D, which is passing, not the best grade as you learn in the school, but it's passing. Big cities have many more Ds you know, than smaller towns do. Um, but again, it's a passing grade. The overall intersection stays C. It's basically the same whether CVS 10 years out is there or not. If you look in the detail of the attachments that were attached to the original report, this leg in turn in 2011, which assumes even in the initial report that Lowe's wouldn't be built at that time yet, that that would be a C 
grade in 2011. But even though it's judged to be a C grade, at that time the CVS impact is determined to be one second more and almost two car lengths rather than a car and a half. And when I asked why is that possible, it actually gets better 10 years later on that turn in terms of what our impact is, is I got told that basically the way a traffic engineer has to look at the project and do the grading is by 10 years you assume that some light adjustment has been made to take into account the heavier traffic that's coming from Highland Street. You don't assume any improvements to the intersection, but you do assume changes to the light that may be um, adjusted to make it work at the optimal level. So we really are a small impact. So again, we be happy to pay our fair share, but we're really suggesting that in this situation where we really don't have any impact now to change the grade level of service, or even 10 years from now, that it would be a very hard job for this planning board to try to parse out what, what might be a fair, small contribution for us to make to that bucket. Um, because remember, under the authority for grant, I mean, for imposing site plan, excuse me, site impact fees, that the town has to use it within six years for the particular project for which it collected. You have to keep it in escrow. If you don't use it for the project within that time, and again, you're going to be collecting from other people and the town itself to make that kind of improvement, then you've got to give it back. So the whole concept of a site impact fee is by necessity under that regime relatively short-sighted. You know, it doesn't allow you to go and say, oh, 20 years from now, we think that, you know, Tenney Mountain is going to need to be a interstate and there's going to need to be all these different improvements made. You know, as in anything, the longer you look out, the more speculative it gets. So the legislature in its wisdom in granting authority to planning boards to impose impact fees and towns to impact, impose impact fees has limited it to six years. And I'd suggest, you know, beyond that, the way we will contribute to all sorts of improvements that the town may make is we'd like to become a, a taxpayer in town. You know, you get to pay, collect your taxes from all the existing taxpayers and, you know, we will pay for part of those improvements. But it would be a real challenge to parse out, you know, which drops of the bucket are um, for this improvement and you also sort of have to focus on what is that improvement. Because after all, you know, it's still a functioning intersection in 2021 overall C, this one turn at D, um, we are proposing that, I mean, we've got, we're within NHDOT jurisdiction here to get a driveway permit. If they think the impact that we're having on this turn is such that the light needs to be retimed, we're recognizing that um, may be something we need to pay for and we've got a similar project with this same sort of uh, impact in another town with a state highway where that's exactly what we're doing. So we have you know, no problem with that. But trying to guess <coughs> when traffic would <coughs> be sufficient in this area to warrant basically you know, the next physical improvement to improve that left-hand turn other than keeping the timing of the existing light would basically to put in a second turn lane. And as I understand the Lowe's improvements, that didn't do any second turn lane. That Lowe's would create a fourth leg to this intersection and that fourth leg to the intersection would require a through traffic lane coming from Highland Street to get over to that new leg of that new shopping center. But that wouldn't do anything to benefit us or that left traffic turn. It would just create a need for three lanes here where now there's only two turns that you can make and really wouldn't leave any room for a second left-hand turn lane. So, 
you know, to try to speculate when that second left turn lane might really be warranted by the traffic, you know, could be quite a job. Um, you know, we're looking out to 2021 and not even seeing a failing grade for that particular turn. And again, and when you think about your experience with turns, you often take a little longer to make the left-hand turn at a light than if you, uh, you know, go straight through or you make a right-hand turn. So again, I think we're looking <coughs> beyond potentially the frame of reference of a six-year improvement plan to make a judgment that you know this is on the drawing boards. This is something we know that um, is going to be needed at this intersection. We need to start looking at all the properties on Highland Street that would potentially contribute to the need for that. Um, again, remember it has to be a rational nexus. You have to look not just at what new development will do that will go in in Highland Street, but also the fact that you've got a nice growing town with a growing university and that this is your connector street from downtown to Tenney Mountain Highway. So this road, I would assume, will get more traffic just because of the success of Plymouth to continue to grow and be a desirable place to live and people want to get from downtown um, out to the highway. So any kind of calculation of what our fair share would be would need to take into account that totally unrelated growth. And that's what, as I understand it, Mira's numbers projecting out to 2021 does of projecting you know what kind of growth is expected taking into account all those sorts of variables and she's judging that left hand turn as still being a passing D. Not the best grade but passing. You know, a lot of people will graduate from high school isn't it tonight <laughs> with you know passing grade and again and I assume is am I right on that Meredith that why you could have a D on one movement and still be a C overall is that a left hand turn is sometimes the slower movement and it's the, oh, the overall grade is the average of all the movements so if, if that means if one's a D one's going to be better than a D so average I to C so it is sort of like taking an exam where mm -hmm. you get the bottom grade you have a curve <laughs> that's right but you get you know you get X's and uh, you know you don't get quite as much on one essay answer as you do on the other but if it balances out the overall intersection is you know and and tearing up an intersection like this to make an improvement that you know brings your grade up slightly is something that you know is a big expense and a big headache um, and those are the sorts of things towns and states have to go through all the time in terms of balancing out when do you do the improvements in addition to when the money is. So, so I guess the bottom line is I, I really would like you to focus first and foremost on the practicalities and the factual basis of this case, not on impact fees generally. Because, you know, like you say, I think your ordinance, as I set out in my letter, is really more designed to fit the requirements for an individual exaction because nobody that I can see has done the study and the work for you to give you a methodology of how do you try to look at the bigger picture and determine how you know much per square foot or some other formula that you should apply all up and down the street to collect money for this futuristic improvement um, and also it's, it's got to be tied to a capital improvement plan where that's been in the plan as this is something that's needed and what date it's needed and this is the methodology of where we it's fair to collect from this group of people who were to impact that. Um, normally that's what you see in an impact ordinance and I've attached a case for you just for your background reading that again a, the legend I mean, the Supreme Court has found that they, that the legislature in authorizing impact fee ordinances didn't mean to burden the planning board with doing all that work 
um, legislatively to decide on a case-by-case -case basis that big picture impact fee. What the legislature has since gone back and done is said, but wait a minute, we never intended to take away from the planning board the power that was there before the impact fee ordinance authority was there to look at each project and say, boy, if your project is triggering a need for this new particular improvement, you've got to pay your fair share of that before we can approve your project. And you've still got that power. Your ordinance sort of really ties into that power more than the other option of a site plan fee ordinance that tries to take a broader view and gives you a methodology for trying to parse out in a broader way um, the impact um, over an area that might influence a particular need for a public improvement. Um, you know, I don't see where anybody's done that work for you. Um, and like, and so I, but again, that all, those are all legal issues. I'd really like you first and more foremost to concentrate on the practical issue of, yes, you're charged by the zoning ordinance to a, fix impact fees in appropriate circumstances. And first and foremost, we're trying to point out to you, this isn't one of those circumstances. You know, we selected this site because it's already improved. It's got a traffic light. You could get in and out of here. Um, you know, it's a C grade now. It'll be a C grade overall, you know, after we build and then 10 years, whether we build or we don't build. And like I say, that inter that one part of the grade does degrade to a D over 10 years, but it degrades whether we're there or not. And that's why we're really saying, you know, this isn't a case where you need to labor long over what an impact fee should be. But again, we don't disagree with Mr. Vignelli. He did point out accurately to you the worst degradation um, that the report shows. We wholly agree with that, it, and you know, and he's really quoting your ordinance to you, saying this ordinance puts on you, planning board, the burden of trying to determine whether a site plan, I mean, a site impact fee is appropriate in this case. Anybody have any questions for CVS? Okay. Not yet. All right. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, could we hear from the town engineer, Mike? Sure. Yes, um, <coughs> sorry, I'll stay sitting down. The, uh, That's fine. When we look at, at intersections and I think everything that uh, the attorney said was, as an engineer would probably say, was pretty accurate. Um, level of service is, is a, sort of the broad measure of how an intersection operates, either overall the intersection or on a single approach. A uh, more specific look at that is the, the queue length, which is the number of cars that back up, or the delay at each approach. That's a little more precise indication. So you may have a, you may have an increase in delay still within a broader level of service on one approach, which is what you have here. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. So, so in this, um, the overall grade, it's a level of service A. It's uh, in the future, it's level of service D, which is, the, is still a function of the intersection, not a failure. I guess um, uh, the, the background information, the background growth was shown in there. That was included. As, as far as um, what my concern is and why I point that out to you is, uh, I guess uh, you know, there's, there's no at this point uh, there's no real guarantee that Lowe's will already built with an A go through the world. It's what the developers what they want to do. There's nothing. There's a approved plan. There's nothing in place that, uh, that will ensure that, that will happen. So that's why I want to take a look at the uh, sort of interim condition here of what it is now, assuming that that's not there. So. So if you have a uh, you know CVS come in and they have an incremental impact at the intersection, you have uh, Lowe's doesn't get developed, and you have four or five other sites across the street similar to CVS that gets developed as well. They all have incremental that impacts the intersection as well. Next thing you know, you have an intersection that doesn't operate so well anymore. Uh, it is a state signal that that is true. It's on a state highway. Um, I doubt the state will come and step up and say, you know, the intersection doesn't work that great. We're going to throw some money at you. So uh, there'll probably be some financial obligation from the town to at least partner with the state in improving the signal sometime in the future, which is whether that's whether that's a, a legal way to apply in fact fees or not, I have no idea to be honest with you. But um, the, the concern that I have is that if you have I guess um, sort of this incremental potential for incremental impact to the intersection. And this is this is this is not a gigantic impact to the intersection, that is true. Whether it's significant or not, it's not up to me. That's clearly up to you guys to determine that. Um, 
Uh, but there is, there is an impact to it. It has not been fully mitigated. Timing, I think uh, uh, timing, uh, retiming the intersection as the intersection sort of matures and traffic widens, I think you do that anyway. So it doesn't really add any capacity to the intersection. It doesn't make it operate better. But if you get to a point where you have a capacity issue in the future, it doesn't really, it doesn't really solve the problem. So, so uh, you know, whether it's possible to, you know, to at this point to, to identify a project and then put some sort of appropriation of a, of, or, or a, a portion, I guess, of the, that project to see as might be responsible for it, I think it's possible to do it. I agree it won't be easy to do it, and it certainly wouldn't be easy to, to come to terms with everybody as far as what that should be. And whether it's a double left turn lane or the additional lanes on 10 Mountain Highway, I don't know. Um, the, uh, I guess one thing I, I will point out as far as the uh, the, uh, the Lowe's plan and whether they have a you know, double left turn lane or no double left turn lane now, I don't, I don't believe they did, but um, from what I saw from the plans that I saw, but uh, what they did do is they had double double through lanes on 10 Mountain High, which allows a lot more of the, the time to be allocated to that side street. So the intersection operates at a much better pace. They may not need a double left turn lane, where in this case, we have a single lane each direction on 10 Mountain High, where you may need more time for the side street to get through. <coughs> so I guess, uh, um, I guess the, uh, the, the the basis for my comment was, you know, was, was well, for me, fortunately, I'm not a decision maker, you guys are, was to just sort of point out that there is an impact here. I guess I'm concerned that if, uh, that if Lowe's doesn't happen, that sometime in the future, if uh, several parties across the street do, then you have some sort of way to, to fund some improvement there, which is the state probably not going to get 100% for, then the town may be holding the bag with uh, a signal that doesn't work that well with a lot of developments that are, uh, that are coming along. So. That's kind of what, that was my thoughts on, on the traffic and why I made the comment that I did. And, uh, and unfortunately, I have to sort of throw it back in the lot to make a decision on whether that's a significant enough impact to uh, the long impact for you or not. But you have had conversations with the town planner in reference to this, and I think we've got your. Yeah, I think, I, think uh, well, I did see the email that I sent out this afternoon, too, which was right. pretty clear on what her opinion is on it. So. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and as far as the, you know, the, the legal issues, I can obviously can speak to those. Okay. I just, uh, I guess what I, what I just, what I, I'm afraid to see is, uh, you know, development occurring to the point where all of a sudden the town is left sort of pulling the bag here, with the intersection is not operating well, and no way, no really funding mechanism to take care of it. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's uh, something I want you guys to be considered. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, at this time, uh, this is a public hearing. I will be opening it up for public comment, but I would like to uh, hear, and uh, our town planner has been talking with uh, Bill Hu, and at this point I'd like Bill to kind of recap. I know we've got a, a, a letter, and I've talked to Miriam on some of your conversations, but if you could just share a little bit with us on the on the history and your thoughts. <coughs> Please bear with me. I'm overcoming the cold that I contracted here. And I'll uh, try and be as clear as I can in speaking to you. Okay. Uh, there's really two issues here. Uh, one of which I uh, was asked to comment on with regard to mitigation action as it affects the floodplain that this proposal uh, is going to be built out with them. And the other is a discussion that I'm hearing here uh, as it relates to impact fees and which I also talked to Miriam some about in terms of its appropriate its appropriateness or not. Uh, let me address this latter issue first since that's what you've been hearing for the last 30 minutes. I, in looking at this project, would have concerns about the intersection as well, but it wouldn't stop there. We do have a capital project in place, ongoing. It's in its 10th year. It's called the Highland Street Improvement Project. We've done several sections of improvements to that roadway, and it's yet to be completed. There's one more major section that needs to be constructed. This project that's being proposed uh, is certainly going to affect Highland Street traffic. It's going to attract more traffic to the west or towards uh, Kenny Mountain Highway 
than would be the case if they didn't exist at that location. So they're going to have a traffic impact on Highland Street from the village all the way out to Tenney Mountain Highway as that is the major collector artery in this town. It has the highest traffic volumes of any artery in this town except for Tenney Mountain Highway and Route 3. The traffic counts that we've made on this roadway uh, range anywhere from 5,000 to as many as 8,000 vehicles per day depending upon whether the school is in session or not with projections of that exceeding 10,000 uh, per day by the, the 2015 time period where this, Tenny, uh, where this Highland Street Improvement Project was hopefully going to be completed by. Now, to put it in historical perspective, when the Walmart project was before the town, the planning board required an impact fee from Walmart for the attractive, for the traffic that would be attracted over Hen Highland Street to Tenney Mountain Highway down to their store. Uh, it, it was obviously going to bring a lot of uh, their customer base through that artery. Uh, that would be the case with CVS. A large percentage, and I would say uh, a majority of the traffic going to CVS will travel over Highland Street. And in that sense, they have an impact on Highland Street beyond the intersection issue that you've been discussion, <coughs> discussing. <coughs> Excuse me. The town is collecting money through registration tax on vehicles registered in this town to help build the, the reserve needed to complete the work that yet to be done on Highland Street, along with taxpayer money and any development in and around Highland Street that has a potential impact on that traffic volume, which this facility, uh, CBS is proposing to build, will have, and thus justifiably could be uh, asked to make, uh, make a contribution uh, to not only the, the light, if it has to be somehow reconfigured in its geometry, but to the Highland Street improvement itself. So uh, as far as the impact fee notion in its broader context, it's, <coughs> legitimate, it's legitimate and it is targeted to specific work on a specific artery that happens to include this intersection, but is more than that in that it's a, a major collector road between Tenney Mountain Highway and the village that bears most of the traffic volume in this community. So if it isn't used for that purpose on Highland Street and or intersection improvements in that six year period, as has been stated by their representing lawyer, that money after six years would be returned to CBS along with any interest earned on that money in the interim period. The second issue as it relates to mitigation of the fill that will be put in to meet the FEMA <coughs> requirements to be a foot elevated beyond the 100 year flood elevation. Um, This, I'm going to break out a little map here and I see which kept sitting behind me and she'll recall this as well I'm sure. Uh, this little uh, flat triangle of land on the south side of Tenney Mountain Highway between Hatch Plaza and Harris Furniture has sort of been a problematical a piece of land uh, for the planning board to deal with for more than a decade. 
Back in the early 2000s, when several proposals were being brought forward for development in that little zone, uh, that area was much discussed. Uh, there were some proposals that never reached the stage of being brought to a formal application that were uh, decided to be withdrawn uh, because of the, the conditions that they had to deal with. Burger King came along with a proposal that was by far the most serious proposal that we had received in, in the little sliver uh, triangle that's just across the street from where the CBS uh, proposal is, is going to be built out. That project, we felt, was on the south side of the dam, so to speak, that Ten Mountain Highway, when it was reconstructed, created relative to the flood plain and the flood way. The only way that area floods out is through a culvert that's about five feet, uh, right adjacent to where the little uh, Plymouth Water and Sewer pump house is located. So it, it, it's an overflow area and represents in its totality a relatively small area. The long and the short of it, without going on here at length, the planning board ultimately decided that the Burger King uh, project that was proposed would not introduce a suffi sufficient volume of fill to warrant mitigation. Um, I don't remember the exact numbers. I'd have to go back into the uh, records of the site plan that's on record here in, in the town, but I suspect that in aggregate their total uh, fill volumes were on the order of 10,000 cubic yards, maybe less, maybe as little as 7,500 cubic yards. The planning board, in discussing that impact, concluded, and not, I won't say unanimously, there was a difference of opinion on that, uh, but they concluded as a board that that volume did not have sufficient impact on the major floodplain, floodway area that it warranted mitigation. Along later came the Woodlawn Credit Union. Woodland Credit Union. A similar type project in terms of its scope and in, in uh, terms of the impact of, of the fill that would be required to accommodate that proposal at the same elevation that Burger King is at. Uh, again, if you look at the cubic yardage that was used to build out that uh, facility. It was, again, I, I would guesstimate in the range of about uh, six to eight thousand cubic yards. We as a board generally felt that the scope of projects that would be possibly brought before us in that general area on the south side of highway would not be of scale that would warrant mitigation at the time that we considered those projects that I've mentioned. Along came Home Depot. Home Depot was another very large scale development far beyond any uh, thing considered on that side of the roadway uh, prior to their application coming before our board. It impacted not only the flood plain but uh, a wetland pond area that uh, was a critical consideration uh, as it related to whether the project would even be entertained in the first place. Uh, the end result was that the Home Depot proposal progressed to the point where 
certain conditions had been agreed upon between the planning board and the applicant where they were going to have to mitigate the fill that they brought in in conjunction with their project. In that case, it was on the order of about 70 to 75,000 cubic yards of material. The other aspect of that, the wetlands, had to be mitigated off-site on a 20 to 1 multiplier ratio, I believe it was, and there was an arrangement that was worked out for that. So, looking at the CVS proposal, and I did ask for a copy of their site plan to, to look at it in relation to these other projects, I would estimate that that project as is exhibited on the documents that you have is probably in the range of 16 to 18,000 cubic yards to build out the structure as they propose to build it out. I... Just a, yeah, we, we got 19,000 in our estimation. So, so I'm reasonably close. close. Yep. Um, I, I would, in my own mind, uh, see that as being sort of on the cusp of whether you want to mitigate or not. Personally, I would not see the need for mitigation at, mitigation for that volume being on the south side, but I can tell you that there are probably others in this room that would argue to the contrary. So that's a judgment that you people have to make as to whether you think that's necessary or not. Uh, I think it's less than the proverbial drop in the bucket as it affects the floodplain being on the wrong side of the dam and uh, that's where I stand on that issue. Okay. Thank you very much Bill. Appreciate your input. I did omit um, the town planner's representative to say a few words if they needed to uh, in reference to um, your findings. I know in a lot of cases uh, Miriam would state uh, state where she feels and what recommendations she felt. Uh, she had expressed to me that she felt that she quoted many of the things that Mr. Will said mm -hmm. uh, the dam and that appears in the planners report. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that it's a different proposal than the Home Depot proposal factored in as well. Mm -hmm. um, and after going around, she initially contacted you, did she not know to find out about this? Mm -hmm. uh, came pretty much to the same conclusion that mitigation on that side, especially the you know lesser in scope, I won't say small, uh, wouldn't require it at this point, though she did think that it would be a good idea to take that into consideration in ongoing developments because once again we have like the traffic study incremental additions to that area <coughs> but she figured that it, or expressed to me that she didn't think that the project required the one-to-one -one mitigation yeah. All right, thank you very much John? yes just yeah. one further clarification at the time that the board made its decisions on these earlier projects it was without uh, equivocation that on the north side of Tenney Mountain Highway any project development in that floodplain or uh, floodway area would require one-to-one -one mitigation mm -hmm. and that's the requirement that in fact was laid upon the Lowe's project when that was before the board. Okay again thank you very much Bill. Uh, at this point, I want to open this for public hearing at uh, 7.23. Do I have anyone that would uh, like to make comments uh, in favor of this, uh, this situation? Mr. Mc State Frank your name. Miller. Frank Miller. Uh, I'm in favor of this development and my feeling on the filling in and uh, terrain change to get this project underway 
would enhance the final piece of this property that's on the south side of Tenney Mountain Highway. Uh, we've had uh, Laconia Electric and the credit union uh, make adjustments to the property and this last piece of property had this been a project to actually redefine uh, the volumetric efficiency of the floodplain and any velocity index change for flood movements or water movements, this would have been done totally uh, to properly shape that land uh, to not only perform as a usable piece of property, but I believe also aesthetically would make it look like it was a uh, compatible companion project. Uh, what we have, as you go out and look, you individually uh, have applicants coming in and the board says, we'll do just this. And then the next one comes in and says, we'll do this. And when you get it all together, it looks like it was done by committee. We need to look at conformal design of the terrain and environmental elements to it. And I think that with this final adjustments to the terrain to be compatible with the requirements of flood levels, building levels, they would make not only that area perform correctly for their uh, flowage of water from their, their backside where the pond is, but also we would make that area look uh, it would look nice. It would have a nice appearance to it. And this would be the final piece that would finish this area build out. I mean, there's not going to be any more between there and Harris Brothers. And, you know, it's pretty much, this is the last final piece. So um, I feel that uh, the mitigation issue uh, being that the size of the project is a nominal size, uh, doesn't deserve the mitigation either. And I think uh, what they'd be doing would be a uh, service to the community to aid in the design and look <coughs> like it's a commercial area, which is what that is, and still be environmentally responsible to uh, maintain any effect that they would have on drainage and uh, uh, any massive flood systems. So I stand in support of the project and would like to see the board approve it. Do we have anyone that would like to speak against the project? Do we have anyone that would like to have uh, some type of general comment on the project? Which? Um, I wasn't at the last hearing, so maybe this has already been answered, but I'm concerned not necessarily about the big intersection onto Tenney Mountain Highway, but the fact that this is this is going to be an another people who are coming from the village who want to go out to this establishment. It's going to be another left-hand turn off of Highland Street just prior to that intersection. And I was wondering if that was part of the traffic study in terms of what the impact of another left-hand turn in terms of backing up the traffic on Highland Street. Because at this point, you know, we've got a slew of left-handed turns uh, going into the various establishments along that section of the Highland Street. And this is going to be the last one before the, before the big intersection. And I'm just wondering what the impact of another left-hand turn. And likewise, coming out of there making a left-hand turn, um, how is that going to impact it? I don't know. I'm just wondering if there was information about that. Okay. Uh, Can I speak? Uh, let me let me uh, someone else uh, have a general comment. Uh, Bill, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to inquire as to what the applicant has used in the way of vehicle counts on Highland Street in their study that uh, they've done. All right, um, Mike, could you? Address that or? Uh, or? Okay. The counts, we did a, a count in um, 
in April. We did a count at um, the intersection of Tenny Mountain High. Penny Mountain Highway and Highland Street, as well as a count at the existing driveway um, on our sites and a count at the driveway to the Woodlands Credit Union. So we did a traffic, in our traffic study, we analyzed those three intersections. So we analyzed the signalized intersection as well as the two driveways. And what were the results? And, um, in terms of getting, once uh, CPS is in in terms of getting left turns out of the site. Um, the maximum number of cars we showed would be two cars waiting, um, which is in line with all the other uncivilized in intersections along Highland Street. And similarly, there's never more than one car waiting to get in and turn onto the site. Okay, Bill. Follow up question then? Did you use any of the town's traffic count information that has been accumulated uh, on Highland Street itself, which covers more than a single point measurement of traffic volume? They've got multiple times that uh, they've taken traffic counts on that roadway uh, and, and can reflect the variability of its volume as a function of time of year, time of day, etc. How we did that is um, we seasonally adjusted the existing traffic. So we looked at um, how traffic works in general in Plymouth and how this, it seasonally fluctuates. And we applied that factor to our traffic counts to make our traffic study present a worst case condition. So it's, we took the existing traffic count, we seasonally adjusted it upward to be a worse month condition, a peak month condition, and um, additionally we added background to the, the future projections to try and cover those variations. Okay, thank you. We don't have any data on daily volume. <coughs> we only looked at peak hours. We didn't look at daily overall traffic on the house. Okay. Mike McGinley, I, you raised your hand with Widge, and then I didn't see you raise it the second time, so I do apologize if no, I, no I missed Thank you. Thank you very much. Mike McGinley, I own the property across the street, <clears throat> and I do simply feel uh, compelled to make the statement that one would think as a result of the recent Supreme Court decisions that there has been an increased amount of interest in property across the street, and in fairness to the applicant and to the board, uh, within the past seven days, I've met with uh, two groups that are sincerely interested in uh, advancing development across the street. Um, so I think when we start thinking or talking about the years 2021, I don't think that property is going to be vacant in 2021. So I would just ask that the board keep that into consideration. I'm not opposed to the CBS as an entity. I do believe, though, that that is, a, uh, is going to be a very heavily traveled intersection in the future. I've had a local site contractor look at it. We've looked at the plans, uh, the number, and it was very, very much a, uh, you know, a rough number. It was probably going to be anywhere between four and $500,000 to properly redesign that intersection. Uh, that, of course, was not a hard number per se, but that was a number that was given from an educated uh, site contractor. Thank you. Okay, anybody else like to make a comment? Bob Dragon. Bob Dragon, <clears throat> I'll be on the property for what this meeting's about. I just wanted to go back to Witch's question. Good to see you here, Witch. Haven't <laughs> seen you for a long time. Uh, I was a little confused on that left-hand turn. Is that the one you're concerned with before the major artery on to Teddy Mountain? Are you considering that a driveway or a main artery? Because there would be a driveway into the business. Is that right? So you're concerned with well, just the driveway going into the business? Then? People are going to have to stop and wait for oncoming traffic mm -hmm. to turn left. And I'm just wondering how far people are going to have yeah. to back up, you know, between all the left hand turns. Okay. All right. <clears throat> I just wanted to distinguish between a major artery versus a, a driveway. Right. 
And my other question, if I had for this gentleman, Mr. McGinley, mm -hmm. do we have a target date of when Lowe's is going to break ground? Could you tell us anything about that? <laughs> No, I don't have any information on that at this time. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Do we have any other comments from the audience? Okay, I'll close the public hearing at 734. Miriam left, uh, had sent us all the instructions, the town's position. There were four items that uh, that Miriam suggested that we discuss, um, that we look at, and uh, that we approve or vote on. Number one was a motion to approve the submitted site plan proposal with the condition that the site plan submittal meets with the approval of the contracted town engineer and that the town engineer provide construction oversight. Number two was a motion to impose impact fees on this project for off-site traffic mitigation improvement, i.e. traffic lights, per zoning ordinance article 10, and it is section F, impact fees. The amount of the impact fee will be re recommended by the town engineer and consult in consultation with the applicant and based on impact the CVS traffic would have on a traffic improvement. This amount will be approved by the planning board and a traffic improvement escrow shall be established for the Tenney Mountain Highway Highland Street intersection per Article 8 impact fees in the Plymouth Site Plan Review Regulation. Item number three, a motion that the compensatory one-to-one -one flood mitigation requirement will follow current local, state, and federal guidelines. These current requirements do not require CVS to perform one-to-one -one or compen compensatory flood mitigation because CVS is not proposing to build in the flood way. Note if the planning board would like to study this matter further, in order to create stricter local requirements for future development, then a subcommittee should be formed to study this matter. The subcommittee can make a recommendation to the planning board, and the planning board can then decide if they would like to prepare a warrant article for town meeting proposing to amend the floodplain development ordinance located in the town zoning ordinance. And item number four, which was not on our mail out, but it was given to us uh, at the time, the, just before the meeting. And number four was to have CVS sign a development agreement that outlines these conditions prior to receiving a building permit. So I will open this for uh, discussion among the board. Um, <coughs> on item number one. Um, how does the board feel? Do we have any comments? Any thoughts? Yes, uh, I do, uh, Mr. Chairman. It seems to me that that's a bit out of order, that um, uh, approving the submitted site plan um, uh, without having um, moved on item number three seems like it's out of place. Okay. Well, I'll take your recommendation that we'll make number three number one, and we'll make number one number three. Would that be satisfactory? Right. So moved. Okay, item number one has been changed to a motion that the compensatory one-to-one -one flood mitigation requirement will follow current local, state, and federal guidelines. These current requirements do not require CVS to perform one-to-one -one or compensatory flood mitigation because CVS is not proposing to build in the floodway. Do we have discussion? Do we have a discussion? I feel that Probably we should uh, weigh uh, our decision in regards to current 
working engineers both for CVS <coughs> and also the town. Uh, we really don't know what the qualifications for other engineers are uh, and we have to take a, a, a clue from uh, from people that, that are experienced in doing this type of work and also in through their education and, and experience. So we can get a, a whole line of engineers from here to Manchester and you probably have an awful lot of various opinions but we hire these people for a purpose and we also have the uh, applicants uh, qualified engineer all say and in fact Mr. Hull said you didn't need medication so I would assume that that unless there's a personal reason for not allowing this uh, operation to go forward, that my, my, my opinion would be that we should vote on having it approved and not listen to every engineer down the line. Does anybody else <coughs> Yeah, I think that um, uh, we've talked about two other developments in that area, the Burger King and the, uh, and the credit union that did not require mitigation. And uh, as Mr. Hula has said, each of those was probably under 10,000 uh, cubic yards of, of uh, fill in the floodplain. Um, but we also talked about the other development, the proposed development that didn't go forward for Home Depot. And that one was on the south side of uh, Tenney Mountain Highway. And it was required, required that that one uh, would be mitigated, even though it's behind the dam. Even though it's not in the flood way, it was required to be mitigated because of its size, which um, I'll, I'll accept Bill's, um, Bill's estimate that that was in the range, I think he said, of 70 or 75,000 cubic yards. Um, this development is in the vicinity of 20,000 cubic yards. So it seems to me that, um, that it's an issue that's worth the discussion of the planning board and it's not a simple matter that uh, because it's not in the floodway that it um, that it ha has to be allowed there is a cumulative effect of filling in the floodplain and the cumulative effect is always felt downstream and is felt by uh, the neighbors may, may I respond well, a little bit. are you finished yeah okay For now. Home, home depot was further up the road Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. I just want to. I just want to make one comment on on Home Depot. Uh, they were going to be uh, filling in on wetlands, so they had, uh, as Bill noted, they had a 21, 20 to one ratio that they had to. Right. Yeah. I, and I I understand that there have been. <clears throat> A lot of terms that have been used tonight. We've talked about the flood way, we've talked about the flood plain, we've talked about the envir environmentally sensitive zone, and we've talked about wetlands. And uh, we've, uh, in some of the m memoranda that we've read, those issues have all been conflated. So this is a simple issue of the flood plain. So. Um, there were really two issues when it came to Home Depot. One of them was the wetland, but the other was the fill-in uh, of the flood plain. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kelly? A couple of things with Home Depot. Home Depot was going to cut into the banking um, in back of their property. And once you cut into the banking, per the Army Engineer Corps of Engineers indicated there was a tremendous amount of water in fact there's an old uh, spring that uh, supplied water for all of the farms up <coughs> in that area before Plymouth put the water there once you got into that bank they were afraid that there'd be a tremendous amount of water being flowed additional water flowed into it besides that the Home Depot is further up the road and it's almost flat with the with the road where this is, is, is the elevation is down quite a bit and it creates more of a dam than what what that did there 
And then the other thing is, it's like all rumors. We start out with 13,000 square uh, uh, cubic feet of earth, and then it's 15,000 cubic earth, and now it's 16,000, and now we got up to 20,000. By the end of the night, we probably have at least 35,000 cubic feet of uh, land being having to fill in there. So let's stay on one figure, and that one figure is a, a non-defined figure because nobody has ever really um, calculated exactly what it is. It's it's all guesswork. So oh. we we have to go. Ex 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 excuse me. Excuse me. Yeah. Maybe you've got, well. got exact figures, but let's stay with one figure. Okay. I w I would say this, John. Um, Bill did a calculation and he came out very close to the figure that CVF had. I so thought he came out with 16,000, they came out with 19,000. So he said 16 to 18, not a good estimate. Yeah. Yeah. That was a good estimate. That was a good estimate. I actually yeah. did our calculations in AutoCAD. And yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think we, I think we have, you know, we, we kind of have a confirmation there. Um, <laughs> Could we get him to state clearly what his yeah. calcu the result of? 19,000 cubic feet. 19, cubic, yeah. feet. Okay. Cubic, yards, yeah. cubic yards, yeah, sorry. Right. Okay, any other discussion on the board? <coughs> Do I have a motion? I make a motion we approve this uh, site application. Uh, again, again, we're talking here. Item number one is the <coughs> miti mitigation. Uh, item number one. Then. Big part. I make a motion that we accept the item number one on this application or whatever. We don't require mitigation. <coughs> right. But, uh, I second. Do we have a second. Second. Um, okay. He can second it. I just have a question. Okay. Um, would it, this be the time to request a subcommittee be? Um, put together for future purposes I, so that we can put that into our zoning ordinance that we have a right to if we feel it's necessary if there's more building to be done my on side. my thought was and it will be up to the board but my thought was that under other business okay. we could uh, good. Yeah. we could go ahead and and talk about the subcommittee and I think that's something that we need to do yep. and we you know, in, in looking at that and thinking about it, um, we need people, uh, we, would, we would have people from the current planning board, but we would have people from other planning boards and other people that had the expertise, you know, to put this together and then at some point uh, present it to the planning board, their recommendations. Okay, um, having a, a, a motion and a second. Uh, we'll vote on the motion that the compensatory one-to-one -one flood mitigation requirement, uh, current local, state, and federal guidelines, these current requirements do not require CVS to perform one-to-one -one or compensatory flood mitigation because CVS is not proposing to build in the floodway. How do we vote on that? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those against? We have one. It's five to one, so the motion passes. There will be no one-to-one -one mitigation. Item number two is a motion to impose impact fees on this project for off-site traffic mitigation improvements. The amount of the impact fee will be recommended by the town engineer in consultation with the applicant and based on the impact the CVS traffic would have on traffic improvement. Do we have any discussion or any questions on behalf of the board? I, Rhonda? yeah, I, my concern is how, I don't know how to ask this question. For instance, CVS may have, just say, 50 cars a day. Mm -hmm. Now, whoever builds one or two projects across on the southern side mm -hmm. has 250. Mm -hmm. So how do you prorate I don't think that they should pay a 50-50 split. Exactly. You know what I mean? So I didn't know if the engineer can clarify that. Um, yeah, I guess that's my question. Mike, would you like? I think what, um, and I don't know if folks from CBS will disagree, but I think what we right. 
if we're going to look at a, an improvement that will mitigate an increase in, um, I guess, delay and queue lengths, uh, it has to be some physical improvement in the intersection. So whatever that is, it would be probably the minimum amount of physical improvements you could make and still not have an increase in the uh, mm -hmm. in the uh, in the delay or the queue lengths. That would probably be what that would probably do is it probably whatever improvement you make because the impact is relatively small, it would more than overcompensate for what their impact is. Mm -hmm. So if we, if, if it was to add a left turn lane or add through lane or whatever the case may be, um, it, would, it would take the level of service from where it is and make it much better than what it is now. So, so then, I, then, then, you're, then you have a, you have the, I guess, the, 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 to wrestle with, you have so much traffic volume there now, you have so much traffic volume that, that CBS is adding. So you really have to look at this as, um, you know, the town is getting the town and the and it drives the road. I'm sure you're getting some benefit here, uh, and CBS is getting some benefit because it's it's mitigating what, what I guess we, we, we determined is or about to come is a significant impact. So, um, so I think the, the the trick is to define a project and be as minimal a project as possible while still making physical improvement at the intersection that would improve the uh, um, not so much the level of service but uh, reduce the delay and reduce the queues, and then so try to uh, appropriate an appropriate portion of that to the. Uh, 35 cars <coughs> of that are coming from CBS one mm -hmm. If I could be allowed to speak as well. All right, just, just one more. Mike, um, I was talking to Miriam today, and she said that there was some book that you use uh, for measuring traffic and the incremental. Do, are you aware? Of? Um, well, he's a bunch. You know, it's a bunch of books, so. I, well, she may be talking about the, the, the trip generation manual or never sure. Right? Um, is that what it was, Brian? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And CBS, CBS traffic engines have already done all that work, so okay. we, we know what the, we know what the, and that was, it was done appropriately and accurately. Okay. So we know what the, what the traffic impact is associated with it. So we know what the amount of volume of traffic is that's going through the intersection right now, because they were counting. So, so we have some basis to, to make some sort of comparison between the traffic that's using it and the traffic that's going to be increased to the site. Okay. Yes, ma'am. But my concern is, is 